deer, a life in five acts. A barbarian, a witch, a murderer, manipulator, an adventuress, but also a fierce symbol of women's refusal to submit to male authority. Medea belongs to one of the oldest cycles of Greek myth. The Argo, the ship on which she travelled from her Black Sea homeland to Greece, had already sailed there through the turbulent waters of the Hellespont long before the Trojan War and Odysseus's voyage after it. The 6th century BCE saw the rise of the Medes and the subsequent Medo-Persian Empire, with which Medea's name naturally became associated. And in literature and art, she began to take on an exotic, non-Greek, that is, barbarian set of characteristics. Classical Greek poets and historians, especially Pindar, Euripides and Apollonius, began to piece together a coherent narrative of her tragic, murderous and adventurous life in endless exile. Her life story falls into five acts like the countless neoclassical tragedies later written about her. And this talk is an attempt to use the ancient epic poet's metaphor from textile production because an epic poet was a rhapsode, a song sower. It's an attempt to stitch the five acts together. The chief text is Euripides' famous tragedy, Medea, but I fleshed out other parts of the narrative to which that intense play, occupying just one day in her life, often alludes. Act one, growing up in Colchis. Medea was born in the 13th century BCE in the newly built capital of Colchian civilization, far up the river Phasis, now called the Rioni in modern Georgia. The Colchians enjoyed considerable wealth from the wine produced in their rich vineyards on the slopes of the Caucasian mountains, from the alluvial gold in the rivers, and from their great flocks of fleecy sheep. They traded both with Greek colonists on Black Sea coasts in what's now Russia, Turkey and Ukraine, and further south with peoples of Central Asia. Euripides' Medea doesn't contain all that much ethnic colour concerning Colchis, although vase paintings suggest that Medea costumes worn while actors were ornate and patterned exotic looking robes and that she wore headgear, peaked headgear associated with Eastern barbarians. The play does mention hemp used for ships' cables, of which Colchis was a notable supplier. And timber was another precious natural resource which the Greeks derived from the Eastern Black Sea. And although it's a Greek pine that the nurse mentions in the prologue, it may partly be real mercantile considerations that made timber such a particular preoccupation of the poetry in the play Medea. Both Jason's and his new bride's deaths are associated with wood. Jason will die from a plank from the Argo when it falls on his head. And in the messenger speech, where the princess is set alight by Medea's poisoned robe. We hear that she first sits down on a chair, which would have been imagined as an elegant item of furniture, of course, made from wood. But as she burns, she's also compared to a laurel tree, the dress like tender young shoots of foliage. Her father stuck fast to the fine spun dress as ivy clings to laurel shoots, and a terrible wrestling match ensued. As her flesh melts from her body, it seems like the resin oozing from a burning pine torch. The works of human hands, chairs, dresses, torches, are confounded in these images with trees that provide timber and with infinitely perishable human flesh itself. In Medea, however, the material item overall given by far the most emphasis is gold. There are several explicit references to the Golden Fleece and the motif of the Golden Fleece, like the legend of the voyage of the Argo, is ancient and mysterious. It's been pointed out that ram's heads, as well as lions and calves, were very popular designs on Colchian gold beads, pendants and bracelets. Rationalising scholars from antiquity onwards have been unable to agree on whether the fleece is a mythological symbol, symbol somehow encoding the panning of alluvian gold in the rivers of Georgia, 
or maybe for the importation of sheep farming for wool from the steppes of Asia, or a primordial symbol of kingship and authority. The Colchian royal family, sprung from the sun god Helios, is even itself called by the chorus the race of gold. And the Corinthian women are hopelessly confused about whether Medea is mortal or immortal. Abundant and elaborate metal costume ornaments dating back to the 5th century, the century of Medea, has been found in graves east of Kutaisi in Georgia and they include diadems as well as necklace, bracelets, earrings and earrings. The bur burial sites around Varni on a tributary of the Phasis Rioni reveal a striking original style of Colchian goldsmiths working there. And from the 6th century BCE, Colchian culture was most vividly characterised by the abundance and astonishing variety of its jewellery. Gold diadems with torques ending with rhomboid, places decorated with chaste representations of fighting animals. All of these constitute outstanding examples of Colchian gold smithery. A particularly intricate example is suggestive of the repeated but varied description of the diadem which Medea sends the princess in the play. That part of the gifted cosmos or, or apparel which consists of a chaplet made of beaten gold, a leith and gold headband, a trinket of Hades, a diadem of finely wrought gold. The princess places the golden coronet on her hair and inspects proudly her crowned image in a bright mirror, one shining metal reflecting another. But this exquisite headband attracts special attention during the princess's terrible death throes. The golden chaplet around her head, says the messenger, let out a terrible stream of greedy fire. Her fine robes, given to her by your children, my dear, devoured the poor girl's white flesh. All ablaze, she leapt up from the chair. She ran away, shaking her hair and her head this way and that, desperate to throw off the diadem. But the golden fastenings held tight, and when she shook her hair, the fire just burned twice as bright. It was impossible to remove it just by shaking her head. This fabulous wealth of Colchis was the basis of the power of Medea's father, the powerful and brutal potentate Aedes, Aetes, the son of Helios, the sun god himself. All the family were tall and beautiful with brown skin, dark curly hair and flashing eyes. But they were also grim, joyless and emotionally dysfunctional. Medea spent her childhood and adolescence escaping from her violent and cruel father and his favourite, her spiteful brother, Absyrtus. He envied her intelligence and he gloated to her about his superior status as a boy. So she spent most of her time in the local temples of goddesses. There, priestesses helped her develop her abilities in horticulture, pharmacology, astronomy, extrasensory perception, and indeed hypnotism. She was clever, bilingual in Colchian and Greek because her nurse had been kidnapped into slavery from a Greek community on the coast of the Hellespont. She also practiced Greek conversation with her brother-in-law, Phrixus, and he was a native Greek in exile. He'd long ago arrived in Colchis on a flying golden fleece, the very one which Aetes ordered should be ordered should be guarded by a giant serpent the size of a trireme. One day, the crew of the Greek ship arrived, led by an outrageously handsome and charming young captain called Jason. He was dressed in a fine tunic and leopard skin. His hair cascaded down his shoulders. Now he'd been sent off to fulfill the impossible task of taking the Golden Fleece to Greece. Medea, who disliked her father and despised the sycophantic men of the court whom he offered her as potential husbands, fell swiftly and desperately in love. After kissing or even losing her virginity to Jason, on the riverbank where the Argo had docked, beneath its arching prow. She fervently promised to help him survive all ordeals if he would just take her as his wife back to Greece. 
With her help and her protective lotions and potions and spells, he was able to fulfil three additional tasks imposed on him by the brutal Aetes. So he yoked oxen, which breathed fire. He sewed the teeth of a dragon and defeated the army of warriors who sprang from the teeth. He was really amazed by Medea's supernatural abilities and realised she would be an enormous asset. And this suspicion was confirmed when she lulled the serpent to sleep so that he, Jason, could grab the fleece. Medea reminds him of this enormous favour in Euripides' play. In her very first speech to Jason, in their first encounter, I saved your life, she says, as all the Greeks who went on the voyage of the Argos together know when you were went to subdue the fire-breathing bulls beneath the yoke and sow the deadly fields. And the serpent, the serpent who protected the golden fleece, the serpent who never slept as it coiled around its sinuously on guard. I killed that serpent and I lit for you the path of salvation. So in a few deft strokes, Euripides' rhetoric brings the famous Colchian episodes before the audience's eyes. Jason's mastery of the fire-breathing bulls in the deadly field and the fleece-policing monster coiling round a tree trunk in a forest. But Medea reminds Jason of these scenes so very early in their quarrel in the play ensures they remain fixed in the audience's consciousness. But Jason, of course, was more than happy to take her with him aboard ship, along with the old nurse, that she refused to leave behind. He told the Argonauts she, Medea, was his lawful wife, as she demanded. Act two, the voyage. So she fell in love with Jason and she flouted a despotic father by assisting the foreigner. Medea had no choice but to escape with him and the other Argonauts. And this meant that none of the conventional rituals were performed that confirmed that a marriage had been duly officially conducted, especially the required formal agreement between groom and father-in-law. Yet Jason and Medea were madly in love and she at least felt that this was enough to sustain their future. She believed what he told her. She would go with him to Greece. There he would claim his throne of Iolcus in Thessaly and they would build a future and a family, a successful married king and queen but her brother Absyrtus pursued the Argo when his ship pushed the Greek ship towards the coast and rammed it against the rocks. She and Jason looked at one another. Either Absyrtus had to die or it was all over for them and the Argo. Now some authors say that Jason killed him. Others say that it was with Jason's help that Medea actually killed her brother, which she would have found less difficult than she imagined. Such was the strength of the sibling rancor between them. They cut his corpse into pieces and they cast them into the sea. So Aetes' attention would be displaced onto reassembling his favourite child for burial. The voyage of the Argo from Colchis to Jason's homeland of Iolcus in Thessaly is the part of Medea's uh, biography which has been told in the most wildly divergent versions. The obvious return route would simply would be westward along the southern coast of the Black Sea to the Hellespont, thence across the Aegean to the eastern coast of mainland Greece. And this is actually what uh, one sensible Black Sea writer called Herodorus maintained did really happen. But far, far more magical and fascinating tales of travels by the distant river Oceanos that was believed to encircle the whole earth were already in circulation by the time of Pindar, so that's before Euripides. Medea is said to have crossed the Sahara, visited Italy, founded a city in what's now Slovenia, sailed in the Atlantic, and to have hypnotised a deadly giant made of bronze who terrorised Crete. Now, since Orpheus himself was on board the Argo, I like to think of all these stories as epic lays that Orpheus composed to entertain the Argonauts en route also to compete with the siren's song and also to perform as a professional itinerant bard after the return to Greece. Act three, Thessaly. 
So eventually Jason and Medea arrived in Greece, docking the Argo near Iolcus at the beautiful port, now called Volos, beneath wooded Mount Pelion. Perhaps she'd already given birth to one or both of the two sons she had with Jason, or perhaps they arrived during the several years that they spent in Iolcus. Fortunately for Medea, her old nurse lived with them and helped with the boys. But there was a problem in Jason's kingdom. King Pelias was still determined to retain the throne and anybody, and anyway, everybody believed that the Argo had sunk. Medea was bitterly disappointed not to be queen. Jason and Medea for a while lived secretly in the port city, away from the centre of the kingdom, while they considered what to do. But eventually, Medea, she persuaded her husband that she should approach the palace and act alone. It was far too dangerous for him. So she arrived at the palace disguised convincingly as a very old woman and offered her services as a medicine woman to the daughters of Pelias. She convinced them that she was a priestess of Artemis and that the goddess had chosen their father Pelias to receive a reward of rejuvenation for his piety. By removing her own elderly disguise, she made them believe in her power to rejuvenate old people. She reassured them further by boiling an old ram and cunningly faking its rejuvenation by replacing it with a sprightly ram in its prime. The credulous sisters cut their father up and boiled his dismembered corpse. The Argonauts did rescue Medea from the women's anger when Pelias failed to jump in youthful health from the cauldron. But the frantic women actually wanted to kill themselves. Jason decided to limit the death count. He persuaded the women that their act had been involuntary. But he was now in a pickle and needed to get Medea and their sons away from Iolcus. So they set out on another much shorter voyage, this time to Corinth. Jason also thought that Corinth, which was a far richer and more significant city-state than Iolcus, would offer him a better arena for self-advancement. Now, Medea's absolute loyalty to Jason and willingness to do anything for him and their children were never remotely in doubt. But under the pressure of this infatuation, her capacity for deceit and murder was developing apace. Jason didn't seem to mind, provided that the deceit and murder were working in his favour. Act 4, Corinth. Medea and Jason dedicated the Argo to Poseidon at the Isthmus and settled with their sons and the nurse in Corinth. They were in a suburban house not far from the royal palace on the Acropolis. They had enough money remaining from the spoils they'd accumulated during the voyage to fund quite a reasonable standard of living. And Medea was happy enough. Uh, she soon made a reputation for herself as a very clever woman, well versed in herbal remedies. She made friends among many local women. Her sons were now of an age, probably about seven and eight, to need a male tutor, and a local man was found and hired. The boys liked him but the ambitious and narcissistic Jason just could not accept this quiet life away from the centre of politics and public attention. He took pains to ingratiate himself at the royal court and he didn't even openly acknowledge that Medea was his lawful wedded wife, nor did he ever take her with him to court and he preferred actually not to be seen in public with her at all. She remained a virtual prisoner in the home, a foreign woman suspected by many. Her women friends had to come to visit her as they do in the play. One terrible day Jason told her that he was going to marry the daughter of the Corinthian king Creon. Creon had no sons, his son-in-law would inherit the throne. Jason didn't have a problem with sharing a bedroom with a 16 year old girl either but he firmly intended to keep Medea around as a mistress and would gradually get his sons by her accepted as legitimate aristocrats in court society. He even told her that he was contracting this new marriage in her interest. I'm doing it for you. 
Medea was shattered and lay prostrate, weeping, weeping inside for several days. This is where the play begins. Creon turned up unannounced and brutally banished her. He knew enough about her to believe she was a threat, especially now that she'd been abandoned and humiliated. Medea thought on her feet and begged Creon to allow her just one day to make arrangements. And he agreed, big mistake. Medea spent a few hours considering alternatives. She thought of murdering Jason and his new wife. She thought of killing everyone involved, including herself. But after a chance encounter with the Athenian king Aegeus passing through, who expressed to her the agony of male childlessness, she realised the way to inflict the most pain on Jason was to kill his sons. So first she pretended to have come round to accept the new domestic situation and sent wedding gifts to Jason's bride. A golden chaplet, a finest Colchian workmanship and a gorgeous robe. But the chaplet was inlaid with tiny containers of a terrible inflammable toxin. When the princess, who some, not Euripides, say was called Creusa Polydon, the poison was released, she was burned alive and her father with her, because he grabbed hold of her in an attempted rescue, and his body caught alight as well. Once these deaths were reported to Medea, she took her sons indoors and stabbed them. Their voices could be heard calling for help, but nobody, nobody dared follow her inside. It is an appalling moment in theatre. Medea is the most immediately accessible of all Greek tragedies, because the relationships it portrays in this divorce drama are so fundamental and there's the figure of the child harming woman, especially the mother who actually kills her own children, the filicidal mother, is the most reviled in our cultural repertoire of villains. And Medea's physical relationship with her children, which is very primal and intense, is what makes so heartrending the awful climax when they're terrified young voices are heard screaming from backstage as she pursues them with a sword before those voices go silent forever. Modern psychologists insist that maternal filicide, murder of a mother's own children, far from being universally decried, is perceived differently in different cultures, is closely linked to economic, social and religious factors. It may be particularly relevant to the story of Medea's murder of her children, that a very important factor in all mothers' valuation of and commitment to raising a child in many cultures is a perception of the father's level of valuation and commitment to them. The figure of the Euripidean Medea has actually frequently been held up as the ultimate example of the ultimate crime the sadistic murder of her love rile has attracted far less censure. One of the reasons Medea has proved so perennially fascinating is that the play thinks about murder as a crime. In one sense it doesn't matter who the people that are murdered are nor whether the killer is male or female. The point is that this is the first play in the Western theatrical tradition in which the audience watches someone make up their mind, decide, make up their mind to kill in great detail and then actually carry out the decision. So the play asks why people commit murder and how they have usually wrestled with terrible emotions like anger and jealousy. The issue is made more complicated because the play does acknowledge that Medea has been involved in a killing before. Of course, that of her own brother years ago in the Black Sea, and then there was Peleus. So this raises the question of whether previous offences are relevant and whether they should be allowed to be used as evidence in a legal trial. But this play in particular tackles head on the issue of criminal responsibility. It actually questions the distinctions, I think, between unprovoked murder and manslaughter under provocation what in the USA is called the distinction between premeditated first degree murder and unpremeditated second degree murder. Medea is the only surviving Greek tragedy 
where a murder is committed in this entirely ambiguous moral terrain. Clytemestra's murder of Agamemnon and Aeschylus's Agamemnon has been planned for many, many years. It's absolutely premeditated. Heracles and Euripides Heracles mad and Agawi and his Bacchae kill their children while demonstrably deluded and completely insane. The nearest parallel to Medea is actually offered by Agamemnon in Iphigenia and Aulis. He authorises the sacrifice of his daughter when clinically sane but psychologically confused and under huge pressure. Now, I believe that Euripides' presentation of what happened outside and inside that resident alien's house in Corinth during the course of a single day in the late Bronze Age is deliberately and carefully crafted. And this is done in order to raise questions about Medea's own stated view and that of many subsequent scholars, interpreters, translators, actresses and directors, the view that she's acting freely with total free will, out of choice, informed by full moral understanding of her actions. It's actually interesting that several contemporary forensic psychologists today have recently argued that when parents separate, children are acutely vulnerable to violence from the abandoned party, but that in most cases, this extremely volatile and dangerous period only lasts for about one week, perhaps two. Children are at terrible risk during the immediate days after their parents separate, even if those parents would never normally be violent at all. This is how explosive and strong the emotions are at this critical time. And by far the most important issue here is the speed at which the events in Euripides' Medea develop. The children's parents have indeed only just split up. Medea's state of psychological shock at being abandoned may be a couple of days old, but in the play she's banished and then argues violently with her husband immediately before she murders uh, anybody. Now, these murders may indeed be premeditated, but the premeditation is incredibly compressed and abridged. Alternatively, it could be argued that Euripides has stretched the precise definition of sudden violence in response to unbearable provocation, the legal terms, to their absolute limits. Euripides Medea not only deconstructs the psychic categories of male and female, but it rivets attention on the blunt instruments that both ancient and modern criminal law needed and today still need to utilise. Provocation in criminal law is a ground of defence found in many legal systems. Now, this kind of defence attempts to excuse a crime by alleging a sudden or temporary loss of control as opposed to a plea of actual insanity and that is in response to another's provocative conduct. In the United Kingdom and some other common law jurisdictions, that plea is only available against the charge of murder and only acts to reduce the conviction to voluntary manslaughter. In the USA, the absence of premeditation is one of the ways of distinguishing second degree murder from first degree murder. Yet, in some states of the USA, premeditation has been seen as requiring only a few seconds of deliberation before the murderer's act, while in others, it's been seen as requiring several hours. How long has Medea got? In England, the crucial terms are in Section 3 of the Homicide Act, 1957, where on a charge of murder there is evidence on which the jury can find that the person charged was provoked, whether by things done or things said, or by both together, to lose his self-control, the question whether the provocation was enough to make a reasonable man do as he did shall be left to be determined by the jury. And in determining that question, the jury shall take into account everything both done and said, according to the effect which, in their opinion, it would have on a reasonable man. Now, this 1957 Act changed the common law in Britain 
which had previously provided that uh, provocation must be more than words alone and had to be in the form of violence by the victim to the accused, subject only to two exceptions. <laughs> One was a husband discovering his wife in the act of adultery, the other was a father discovering someone committing sodomy on his son. Instead, the 1957 Act provided that provo provocation could be anything done or said without it having to be an illegal act. The provoker and the seized could be third parties. So, Creon. If the accused was provoked, who provoked him or her is irrelevant. Now, my view that Euripides is making us all scrutinise the difficulty of distinguishing between provoked and unprovoked murder is supported by the fact that this distinction was acknowledged in the legal system of his own day in classical Athens of the 5th century BCE. There has survived a speech by the Athenian lawyer Lysias called On the Murder of Eratosthenes. And this is the actual defence speech of a man on a trial, on a trial certainly within a few decades of the premiere of Euripides Medea. He freely admits that he's killed a man named Eratosthenes. He's asking to be acquitted though, because Athenian law allowed a man to kill another man whom he found in bed with his wife. No entrapment was allowed, and the occasion had to be proven to have arisen spontaneously. But the killer did not have to prove that he'd only just discovered that the affair was going on. Now, even to raise the question of diminished responsibility in the case of Euripides Medea may seem fundamentally misguided. It's horrible. And at the point that she finally makes up her mind to commit child murder, she notoriously states that although she's well aware that what she's going to do is wrong, her internal organ of passionate emotion, what the Greeks called her thumos, has overwhelmed or conquered the conclusions to which her deliberations have or would lead her. That is, her emotion has overwhelmed, conquered her reason. These two iambic lines, actually favourites of ancient philosophers, explicitly frame her as the protagonist in the earliest known version of any Greek myth to make a mother kill her own children knowingly. This shocking turn was almost certainly Euripides' own invention in 431 BCE, and it was a shocking departure from the ancient convention by which filicidal parents were exonerated up to a point by a fit of madness at the time of the commission of the crime. And the two great examples, of course, are Heracles in Heracles Mad and Agawe in the Bacchae. But does the play imply that Medea has really been able to think clearly about what she's doing? At the beginning, we hear that Jason and Medea arrived in Corinth as man and wife some time ago. Medea is described by the nurse as someone who has won a warm welcome from her new fellow citizens and seeks to please her husband in all she does. But at the moment when the play opens, Jason has, it seems, just a day or two ago, abandoned Medea to marry instead the Corinthian princess, the daughter of Creon. Now, the exact timing of the wedding rituals is left very ambiguous. Now, that's partly because there was no one exact minute in ancient Athenian law when a couple became completely married legally. Uh, that is at least until the birth of the first child acknowledged as his by the father. It took a long time. Medea's been lying prostrate and unfed ever since she heard the news that she had just lately, is the words, abandoned by her husband. So this is for a period of time which can't be understood as more than hours or a few days at the very most she'd have died of starvation. Although her nurse is terrified of what she may do and feels fear of a general kind on behalf of the children until after the ague scene, that is until more than halfway through the play there's only one suggestion that the children are in serious danger and that suggestion is Medea's own inclusive curse but on her whole family comprising the children, herself as the wretched mother, the father, and the whole household. 
the occurrence that actually precipitates her into action of any kind is Creon's arrival to announce her banishment with immediate effect. And all the rest of the events of the play then accelerate over a matter of the very few hours grace she succeeds in extracting from Creon. The exile decree is certainly a measure which has only just been taken since it's to announce Creon's decision that the tutor arrives. It's the immediate impact on Medea of this fresh blow that the play dramatises. Medea commits all the murders during the same day she receives this news. She has less than 24 hours to find a solution. It could be argued by a barrister this is really unbearable psychological pressure. In the wake of the atrocity, Jason soon arrived from the palace. He demanded to be let in. But Medea had one more piece of wizardry in store. Despite her skill in medicine and incantations, Jason had as always thought she was an all too human woman. But now she arrived over his head on a magical flying chariot lent to her by her grandfather Helios, the sun god. Jason realised that she wasn't just inhuman and inhumane, she was superhuman. She held conversations with gods. The boy's corpses were dangling from the chariot. She taunted Jason. She refused to let him touch them. She flew off to bury them at Hera's beautiful sanctuary at Acraea, across the Corinthian Gulf, and then resumed her flight path to Athens. Act 5. Athens. Medea landed in Athens, the third Greek city in succession in which she'd arrived as an exile. When she'd met Aegeus in Corinth, he'd promised to offer her sanctuary if she was indeed banished from Corinth. She presumably returned the chariot to Helios, threw herself in Athens on Aegeus' mercy. Now, Medea had learned from Jason about opportunistic marriages into royal families. Aegeus was a sad, an elderly widow, widower, and no match for this articulate and beautiful woman who craved security, a royal home and another child. She'd also decided never ever again to marry a man who was her equal in either looks or brains. Aegeus married her almost immediately on her arrival to the consternation of his people. They had heard rumours about what had happened in both Iolcus and in Corinth. Now, although Aegis believed he'd never succeeded in impregnating a woman before, Medea knew exactly how to make him sexually active enough to father a child on her. Nine months after the wedding, she produced a baby son, whom Aegis even allowed her to call Medus. Usually boy children took names from their father's family tree rather than the mother's. Some people even alleged in whispers around Athens that the son was not his, but Jason's. Perhaps he was. Medea wasn't telling though and did not care. She was safe, living in a fine palace near the Athenian Acropolis. She was wealthy, generally respected or at least obeyed, and crucially a mother again. Moreover, her son would one day, she believed, succeed Aegeus because he had produced no previous children. Or had he? Medea's final banishment was the consequence of the arrival of Theseus in town. Theseus was a handsome, athletic and ambitious youth who had already succeeded in modelling himself on Heracles, killing various brigands and monstrous animals. When he turned up at the Athenian court, the omniscient or at least hyper-perceptive Medea realised that he was Theseus, Aegeus' son. Aegeus had once slept with the daughter of a king in Troads and in the Peloponnese. So, however, at about the same time, had the god of the sea, Poseidon, one or other of them, was Theseus's father. Medea had to act. Remembering Peleus's tactic of trying to wipe out a younger rival when he sent Jason off on the quest for the Golden Fleece, she persuaded Aegeus to command Theseus to capture the vicious fire-breathing, man-eating, cannibalistic bull of Marathon. But unfortunately for her, the powerful youth dispatched this task 
with almost casual speed and brutality. So next she tried to poison Theseus. But her criminal career and life amongst Greek aristocrats now stalled forever. Aegis recognised Theseus from some armour he had left long ago in Trozen. Medea was forced to flee into exile one more time. So where did she go? Some say she borrowed that cha magical chariot again and returned to her homeland in Colchis with her son, Medus. She would have been safe there now because her father was long dead. And Medus did later become the ancestor of the Medes of Central Asia. And so Media, Medea founded a family line that rose to be a world superpower. Other authors claim that she lived quietly in the far north of Greece, dispensing herbs to local peasant farmers. But there is no record anywhere that she ever died. Perhaps the divine element in her nature gave her immortality and she's still out there somewhere today. But whatever happened to this complicated person, she certainly lived on in the world's imagination. Ovid and Seneca both wrote plays about her. St Augustine performed her in a North African theatre during his pagan youth. Medieval fabulists both demonised and praised her. As soon as Euripides' tragedy was rediscovered in the Renaissance, she began to exert a powerful influence over all the Western arts especially painting, theatre and opera. Medea now shocks audiences in theatres across the planet, but she will always divide us. Her crimes were appalling. But ancient authors succeeded in showing how they were the desperate expedience of a highly able woman living under unbearable patriarchal constraints. Medea was oppressed by her father and brother, she was frustrated by Pelias' tyrannical refusal to recognise Jason's claim to the throne. She was exploited. She was exposed to racist and sexist abuse and humiliated by Jason. She was brutally banished with Creon, and then insulted at the speed at which her decrepit second husband lost interest in her and their baby when his older son turned up. It is impossible not to admire her spirit and her refusal to give up in each of the serial predicaments in which she found herself, even though the vicious murderous strategies to which she resorted atrociously slaughtered more innocent people than guilty ones. Thank you.